Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope uh, I have on my slide Fabulous Fridays. Is that true, Carrie? Yes, that's what I see. Oh, good. I was afraid. I've been practicing, so I don't do it wrong, but wanted to make sure it was up there where everybody can see it. I uh, would like to welcome you to our Fabulous Fridays. And just a reminder that these sessions are being sponsored by the Montana 4-H Foundation and also the Montana uh, Center for 4-H and Youth Development. So we're delighted to have their participation. What we're going to be looking at today are uh, kind of a sad topic in a way. Uh, my loved one just passed away, and now what? So there's just things that need to be done, and we thought we would share some of those with you. Uh, for those that I haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Marcia Getting, and I'm the Family Economics Specialist with Montana State University Extension. And one of our roles is to take the university to the people throughout the state. So pre-COVID, I was traveling all over and having the opportunity to give live presentations. And during this time, it's been a little bit different. We've uh, opted to go to webinars. And we've had some of our participants share with us, wow, this is really neat because now I don't have to drive an hour uh, to get to town and I don't have to drive home after a night meeting. I can just sit in my living room and watch. So I think we've all learned some things from the past couple of years. Now, my co-host today is Kim and Kim Woodring is from Tool County uh, up there in Shelby. And she's going to be sharing some information with us as well. Our webinar assistant is Carrie. And if you've had a chance to utilize any of the resources that are listed at the website, uh, Carrie's listed them all. And it's really neat because all you have to do is click on the link. You don't have to write out all that long stuff. And so for much of the information today, what we will be doing is suggesting that you go to that website and take advantage of the links that are there for refreshing of information, but also additional information. And we are also delighted that later in the program, we are going to have the opportunity to meet one of our outstanding 4-H youth who is, a, who is an ambassador. And well, I'll let her tell her story once we get to that section. We'd like to give a, a warm welcome to all the Montanans that have decided to join us this morning. It's always neat to get a sense of where everybody's from and say hi out there and think of some of the people that I've met previously. And then some, all we've done is uh, work over uh, the internet system, it seems like. We also are delighted for the participation of some of our out-of-state folks. So we welcome you to our Montana Extension Fabulous Fridays. Kim, how about you share the engagement tools that we're going to be using with our participants today? Hi, sorry. Um, so our first participant engagement tool is a poll for you guys. Um, if you could answer the question um, <laughs> the first question is, were you in 4-H during your youth? And if you were, uh, please select A. And if you were not, you can select B. But if you were, please enter your state or your county in the chat. We'd like to see that. Part of the reason for this question is uh, when I had a chance to review the chat comments uh, from last week, I had an individual uh, who was able to cite the 4-H pledge, the whole thing, Kim, it was so cool. So I thought, you know, I gave her a card anyway, even if she didn't get the trivia <laughs> right, you know, from one 4 -er to another. There's one that just commented and said they were from Lake County. Uh-huh, all oh, good, good. I was a Tool County, well, I was a 4 -H -er in Glacier County, but now I work in Tool County, so I kind of flip-flopped here. Uh-huh. But I still get to work for the same fair, so that's fun. Okay, so well, it looks like we've got some uh, participants here that have responded in with the, with a poll, and 57% didn't belong at 4-H. Yeah, interesting. I wonder if they they know about 4-H or if they will learn about it through us. Well, they will when we have Brianna or no, not Brianna, 
Brianna. We've got a Brianna specialist and a Brianna 4 ager so <laughs> of course you can't keep things straight. Um, our second participant engagement tool will be another poll. Um, this will be regarding what actions you took as a result of joining us for Fabulous Fridays last week, February 4th. Um, did you A, review your letter of last instru instruction? Did you B, start your letter of last instruction? Did you use the MSU form to start your last instruction? Did you share the information about a letter of last instruction with your friends and family? Did you read the Mott Guide about the letter of last instruction? Did you have other life priorities so you didn't get around to starting your letter of last instruction, but you intend to? Or did you G, other? Will you share that in the chat room? And you can select more than one of these. So we'll give you a few seconds to select these. I can hear that sound. Ooh. No, you can. I'm not in that room. Oh, interesting. I wonder if it's your microphone. Maybe. Yeah. Is it bad? It's not, it, what it reminds me of is Kansas windstorm. <laughs> you <laughs> mean the wind all the time. Wind. A cut bank windstorm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll see if I can move while you're doing your part. Okay, great. So we had some that reviewed their letter of last instruction, some that started their letter. We're kind of all over the board here. I have a couple here and uh -huh. there. A lot yeah, and of were honest with us and they had other life priorities. Priorities. I can identify with that. <laughs> Okay, well, and I'll just throw out, it, it's informational to us to find out, you know, what kinds of things are we doing that encourage you to take some action? And we also realize in a, a week time, you know, there, there are other life priorities at times, but uh, the fact that you're here, the fact that you're listening to this particular webinar does show that you've got the interest. So we'll count that as well. Someone just shared in the chat that they talked about it with their husband. So that was good. Yeah. All right. So if you guys have any questions during the ch the webinar, you can just type your questions in the chat and we can get to them. We'll interrupt as we go. We will also remain on the WebEx for 15 minutes after the webinar. So if anybody has any more questions, they can ask them in person. Well, they can turn on their mic and ask us. And Marsha, so you are the wildflower enthusiast. How can you work wildflowers into our program? I see you have one at the bottom of this slide. That oh, isn't that a pretty flower? <laughs> it can be a beautiful flower, but it's actually a noxious weed. It's leafy spurge. <laughs> yeah, I, I had this for a practice that we had, and I was just waiting for Kim to say, Marsha, that is not a pretty little flower. <laughs> it is a noxious weed but I kind of had to draw our attention to it. And that kind of just goes to show uh, some of the things that we think are pretty are not with that type of thing. But I think all these flowers here are safe ones. And I like to use wildflowers to help individuals realize, um, maybe m remember some of the things that we talk about. Uh, I'm not good at, at telling jokes. Um, I'm not good at using cartoons. I mean, estate planning is a serious topic, but I like to use the wildflower names as just, you know, it's a reminder, help you remember some of the key points about what we're doing today. And I also wanna share that I do not, and my husband does not either, you know, when we're out in the woods, we do not pick the flowers. We just kind of made a commitment that we want to take these uh, wildflowers in place. And I gotta admit, there's times when that's a little bit challenging. So this just shows me in my outdoor studio, so to speak. Uh, I've got two gigantic golf type umbrellas. I have black velvet at the back and I've got a stand to put my uh, camera on and that's so that you can get a close up. So we didn't kill any flowers. Now this is the steer's head. And the reason I just love the steer's head, besides the fact that it's kind of neat, but very tiny, and you can find them in Yellowstone in May, typically, is I want to steer you. I want to steer you towards some of the time-intensive tasks that need to be done right away, 
And then I also want to steer you to some of the legal things that will need to be done eventually. And I want to steer you to Mont Guides. As we go along, we're going to be mentioning different Mont Guides that we have available from MSU Extension. And this is one that a colleague uh, authored and we kind of co-authored, but it's settling an estate, what do I need to know? And it really takes it from the very beginning to the very end. And I think that's a, a mock guide that you would find very useful. It's one that is listed in that area that Carrie did for us. We have an evening primrose here. And I don't know how many of you have seen those, but they're very, very beautiful. But you've got to get with it if you want to see one because they start opening up. You know, you see it right there in the morning and then by noon, poof. So they're around for about 24 hours and you can see what they look like. This white one opened up today. The pink one had its outing yesterday and it's already looking like that. So what I'm thinking of here maybe are time sensitive tasks. So Kim, do you have some of those that you could mention to us that really need to be done after a person passes away? I do, Marcia. I also made a little scenery change for you. So hopefully the sound didn't follow me. Um, so some of your time sensitive tasks that need to be completed are making sure that you arrange for organ donation if that is what the deceased person wants. Um, I personally have a little designation on my driver's license that says I would like my organs donated. I don't know if other states have that as well, but I know Montana does. You may also need to arrange for the transportation of the body to the funeral home. And you may also need to arrange for cremation or burial, depending on whatever their wishes were. We also have a very nice mock guide on cremation that you could check out in our resources. Some of our other time sensitive tasks include locating their letter of last instru instruction that we talked about in our last webinar. Make sure to follow the directions of the deceased. You also need to be sure to arrange for care of others that may have been under the person that died. Perhaps they're leaving behind a spouse or some minor children, or possibly some other dependents, such as an adult child with special needs, possibly Down syndrome. There may also be a possibility that the grandparents are raising their minor grandchildren. So you need to make sure that you arrange for care for them. Yeah, and Kim, this was really hitting home uh, when uh, my dad passed away because my mom had, uh, at that time, late stages of Alzheimer's. And so here I am in Montana, another daughter is located in South Dakota, and then the one in Kansas was in a situation where she couldn't get away because she, <laughs> so we were in a panic. Uh, and thank goodness we had wonderful neighbors that were able to come over and be there with mom because we just didn't want her to, at that stage, be by herself. That makes sense. <laughs> um, you may also need to secure the deceased's home by keeping the door locked and some valuables locked. Uh, you may also need to monitor the mail surface. You never know who could be sneaking around once you announce that the person has passed away. So it might be a good idea to keep their house locked. Yeah, and I may have shared that story last week about uh, the funeral was going on and people were noticing that so-and-so wasn't there and just wondered about something happening. And it turns out that so-and-so was at the house and just grabbing anything and everything that she thought she should have. And oh, of course, no. uh, yeah, isn't that just awful? Uh, so no wonder that family isn't speaking to her anymore. No kidding. Um, something that I didn't think of before this workshop, but Marsha brought to my attention is disposing of any perishables that may be left in the deceased's home, such as food in the fridge or in the cabinets. Um, you have you ever seen what a loaf of bread does when it's left forever? <laughs> you know, it can get beyond green. So yeah, yeah. Their, house, their house might be empty for a while afterwards, so you may need to clean all that stuff up before something starts to smell. Um, another thing that you need to notify or you need to be aware of is um, notifying 
Oh, you may need to arrange for care of your pets, your livestock, and your plants. Um, I have inherited a few of my house plants from some deceased relatives, and I think it's a really good way for me to remember them by. So that might be something that you think about when you're, you know, writing your will or whatever um, to leave your relatives certain plants if they really liked them. You may also need to notify people of the deceased. This may be your family members, friends, acquaintances, possibly their religious leaders or church members, possibly their primary care doctor and their attorney and their accountant. We had someone also mention that maybe um, you should also dispose of all of their prescription drugs. Oh, that's a good idea. That's really good. So take this tip from the evening, evening primrose, take care of your sensitive tasks as soon as possible. Marsha, do you have some estate planning trivia questions for us? Oh, certainly, so that I have a chance to give away some of my note cards that I've been spending two years putting together because I haven't been able to have them available out there. And so this is the deal that you, if you answer the question correctly and you're the first one to do so, you could win a note card. Now, this is a question that I did ask last week, and yes, a person got it right, so that person knows who they are, so you can't answer this again. I want to give the opportunity for others. What is a devisee? You see, I'm hoping that you were curious enough that you decided that you were going to look it up. So Carrie's in charge of looking in the chat room and see who it is that responds to that first, and they will get a card. So moving along. We have here a wood nymph, and I don't know how many of you have ever seen one of these. They're very, very pretty, but they're about this tall. I mean, and to try to take a picture of a, of a flower that goes like this, and it's that tall. I mean, you're down on the ground and you're groveling. And when I got this one, I was so proud of it. I just had to work it into the program. So I thought, what could I do? What could I do? Ah, family members uh, would, make decisions okay and these are some of the decisions we're talking about if the person that died had not already given prior directions but there will be those decisions and sometimes you know mom doesn't want to make them until all the kids get together and when kids are coming from overseas or something there's just some of those things that have got to be done so we've got to plan the memorial service, uh, decisions on the casket, you know, and when I'm in there looking and I'm thinking of my dad, and I'm saying, oh, you know, he would be so disappointed if we spent a lot of money on a casket because he just didn't feel that was that important. Well, okay. Uh, then the funeral service and uh, visiting with the minister, the pastor, uh, the headstone doesn't need to be done immediately, but some people do it earlier. I remember one time we went home and, and mom and dad are both smiling and they're looking at us and we say, well, what did you do for your anniversary this year? They went and picked out a headstone for both of them. And so they took us out to the cemetery and we got to see the headstone. Uh, that was there and you know they had something about their three daughters and of course we were kind of honored with that but I thought you know that's not a bad idea is when you get to your 90s maybe that's time to pick out your own headstone uh, and then eventually there's going to be somebody in the family that is going to ask the question okay uh, does the estate have to go through probate and we all want to avoid probate or, well, I should say, most people say they want to avoid probate because of the cost. And yes, that is a consideration, but there's things that you'll learn next week of how you can avoid some of those costs. But the, the, the thing is, property would have to go through probate if it's in one person's name only. So if dad had all the property in his name only, and he didn't write a will, we've got to go through probate. Same way if we have somebody that owns a tenancy in common type property. And tenancy in common is when you have, for example, two people, and these two people own uh, a house. Now, it doesn't mean that we 
draw a line down the center of the house and say, well, dad owns this half and mom owns the other half. They each own 50% of the whole thing. And that would be the same thing if we had three kids and three adult children inherited property from their folks. So what they did was put it as a tenancy in common. Well, if one of them dies, it's only that one third that goes through the probate process. And uh, probate would <laughs> be necessary if you've got a will, because we've got to validate that will. And if you don't have a will, then the law of interstate secession steps in in Montana and says, this is where your property is going to go. Your legislators have got together and said, this is how we think this person would want their property to be distributed. And it could be right along the lines that you have. On the other hand, that may not be what you have in mind. Then property uh, would not go through probate if there is a beneficiary designation. And a good example of this would be your life insurance. It would be any of your retirement plans that have a survivor benefit. All of those things do not have to go through probate. And joint tenancy with right of survivorship. You know, a lot of people tell me, oh, that's why we put our property in joint tenancy. We want to avoid probate. Well, true. The property does not go through probate but we still need to do a procedure to get the deceased person's name off the title. And our legislature has provided us a way to do that. So we've written about that in a mock guide, how to transfer joint tenancy property without doing probate. And they did the same thing with the life estate. I mean, everything is already determined but the reason we want to get the deceased name off is if you look later on, mom dies, dad's already deceased. They had it in joint tenancy. Well, if that joint tenancy still exists when mom dies, then we've got to do all the extra paperwork to prove that dad died first and then mom is dying second. And I had an agent who will remain unnamed who I had shared this with. And uh, turns out that her parents never got around to doing that. And then they moved out of state. And then the state that they moved to, she told me they spent $5,000 getting this joint tenancy up to the standard that they needed for that particular state. And she said, Marsha, I should have listened to you. And, and I tried not to go, mm -hmm. but yeah. It would, it would have saved them some money. So, Kim, tell us about other assets that don't have to go through probate. All right. Um, some other assets that do not have to go through probate, probate are payable on death designation assets, or POD. These would appear on your savings accounts, your checking accounts, your certificate of deposit, or your U.S. savings bond. I'll throw in a thing about United okay. States savings bonds. I was aggravated when I was going to put beneficiaries on mine because I wanted to put all my nephews. No, a United States savings bond, Kim, you can only do one beneficiary. And I didn't know that. So live and learn. Marsha went through it so we don't have to. <laughs> yeah. um, so at the death, uh, the ownership of these assets would pass directly to the POD beneficiaries that you named. You would not need a probate. You would just need to show an affidavit of death and a government issued photo ID. Another asset that would not have to go through probate are the transfer on death resignation registration or TOD. These are stocks, bonds and mutual funds those TOD would transfer to beneficiaries without probate. Oh, and I learned something new here too, Kim, is those uh, farmers and ranchers out there that do have C corporations, et cetera, um, you can pass that stock using a TOD. So I thought the law was just for the public ones, but it can be for those family share type things as well. So keep that in mind. Good to know. 
Um, okay, so the next slide. The transfer on death deed or the TODD or TODD is a way to convey real property to one or more design beneficiaries upon death without a cost of probate. And a real property is anything that's fixed to the ground. So Marsha gave me an example yesterday that was about trees. If you have trees on your property, they are real property. But once you cut them down, they are personal property. Um, another participation uh, example that we have for you today for trivia for a card from Marsha is what is the meaning of the word ancillary probate? So we'll give people a couple of seconds to look at that. And while we're waiting, I'll just say that flower that happens to be on your right, uh, I happened to find in California. And it looked very similar to what we have in Montana that are called monkey flowers. And it turns out it's, it's a, now if I get this straight, there's species and up the line, See, that's why I don't try to learn the Latin names or anything. But this flower is a, a monkey flower, but there's a name in front of it, like a famous scientist that discovered it. Well, we'll have to do some Googling after this. <laughs> if probate is necessary, a personal representative or PR would be appointed. They would be nominated in your written will or they, if there is no one nominated, they may be appointed by a district court in priority provided by uniform probate code. And one thing I'll throw out here in case you should want to leave it up to the state, it goes all the way down and at the bottom is your creditors. I don't think we want our creditors to be our personal representative. So let's write that will and let's nominate somebody so something like that doesn't happen. A personal representative for a veteran would inquire about benefits and special arrangements. And to find more information about the veterans, um, please follow this link below. Is this link on our resource page as well? Yes, as of this morning, we've got those. Carrie, you know, is great. She got them up this morning because they we came across them as we were doing some of our, our practicing. And I thought, oh, I don't want everybody to copy this down. And that's what's so neat about having those PDF files there, you know, boom, and you've got it. So take advantage of it. So thanks, so, Carrie. Yeah. Oh, I, I just discovered in the chat room, only I don't get it, there's a little blue cloud that came up and said, is a personal representative the same as an executor? And that is true. Montana passed the Uniform Probate Code. And so as a part of that code, they're using the term personal representative, or you'll find a lot of attorneys using PR for short. And executor and administrator are also used in other states. That's good to know. It's interesting how the different states have different, different meanings. So the PR or the personal representative would cancel the deceased person's driver's license, possibly their email or their social media accounts and their prescription medication. Yeah, so see the person that suggested that were just ahead of us because I was thinking, didn't we have that on a slide somewhere? But it was later. Yeah, they so, were ahead of the game. For you. Yes, very good. Good job. Um, they may also need to close some credit card accounts. They may also need to notify all credit bureaus to prevent identity theft. And I've had some personal experience with this last year. And let me tell you, the hours that it takes to straighten out something like this is awful. And if I could have got my hands on the people that stole my identity, I probably would have been tempted to strangle them. It was a mess. And, you know, it, I felt funny because when I went into the bank, it's almost like they were looking at me like, oh, are you one of those people? 
And I said, look, you're the bank that gave the credit card to this person and blah, blah, blah. But they had my mom's name, my social security name, uh, number. They had everything that made it look like it was me. And it wasn't spending. I wouldn't buy a motorcycle. <laughs> that was probably your first clue that it wasn't you. <laughs> yeah. Um, the personal representative may also need to print notice to creditors in the paper, the newspaper. They may also need to pay creditors and other bills. So another trivia question for you guys. How long do creditors have to notify the personal representative of a deceased person's debt if notice is, if notice is published in the newspaper? So while people are writing their answers there, I'll just focus on the vertical flower. And that is one that I found in Oregon. So Oregon people, hello. And it's called a skull cap. So it seems like I should be able to work that in somehow, but I haven't figured it out. So if anybody has an idea, that would be great. Okay. Maybe use your skull. <laughs> So take this tip tip from the wood nymph. The family members would help with the PR, the personal representative with the settlement of the estate. So often what happens is the personal representative ends up hiring a, an, a, an attorney to help with things. Sometimes um, the adult children that are in the community have a better sense, you know, of what's going on. And those that are out of state, um, they just say, go forth, do what you need to do. So it's, it can be kind of a family thing as well. Well, Marsha, why should the PR ask for an appraisal of real property of the deceased? Well, this is something that in the old days, people didn't pay that much attention to, but today it is very important. So what I'm doing here is working in a flower that I think is quite rare and had, I've only seen one and it's called a white, well, it's called an albino fairy slipper. It really does exist. And this is what one looks like normally. So I figured, yes, I'm going to work it into my program. So what can I do? Aha, I'm going to use it to talk about basis. Okay, now all of us that have real property have basis in that property. That's the amount of investment for tax purposes. Okay, and I want to take Grandpa Albino, and what he did was pay $50,000 in 1971 for this ranch. So we're not going to complicate his life. We're just going to say, Grandpa bought it for 50000 There haven't been any improvements on the land. So therefore, his basis is $50,000. That's what he paid for it. Well, Grandpa Albino passes away. And in his will, he is leaving the ranch to his grandson, Greg Albino. Okay. So I want to know what basis then does Greg Albino have in his inheritance of this land that he got from his grandfather? So these are your choices. You can say it is $50,000, it is $6 million, or it's the difference. And I think we've got a poll that are going to come up where you'll have a chance to vote, but we see some of you are already entering in the chat room and that's fine too. That tells me you've got your fingers ready. So is it the 50,000 that grandpa paid, the 6 million, which is we're calling the fair market value on the date of death, or the difference between the two, or are all of these wrong? Okay, and that's when I added, Carrie, not your fault, that was mine. Okay, let's see what people have said with that one. Okay, our results. 
we've got 26% that are saying it is the 5,950. We've got 18% that said the 6 million, and we've got 8% that said it was 50,000. Okay, it appears that what we've got here is only 18% of you got that particular one correct. You see what happens with this real property and our stocks and bonds and anything that we have that has value, it is stepped up in value to the fair market value at the date of debt. So therefore, Greg's basis in this land is six million dollars. It's not the 50,000 that grandpa had. So we got that in our brain, right? It stepped up in value to the fair market value. Okay, so let's say whatever happens, uh, Greg has decided he's going to sell the ranch, okay? And so he's going to sell it for six million. Now, what is the capital gain amount? Share that in the chat room. And Carrie, you could read those out. Kim, did you ever get where you could see the chat room? I can see them every so often, but not oh, okay. all the time. Like oh, I interesting. That posted that last question. Yeah, Carrie said try going all the way down to your right hand side, and it could be hidden down there. So click. I know I couldn't get it to work either. So, Carrie, what are we hearing? Uh, Marcia, three people just said zero. Zero. Okay. Well, it turns out that you guys are right. There is no capital gain. Because you see what happened is Greg sold it for the amount that was the fair market value when Grandpa died. So, therefore, no additional income tax. There's not going to be any Montana inheritance tax, and there's not going to be a federal estate tax on that amount. So, Greg uh, is one happy camper. Okay. Now, that's why we want the personal representative to get an appraisal of the property, the land, the home, and we should do things with the stocks and bonds. And what they do with that is they look at the date of death. Then they took, take the high and they take the low that day and they give the average. And that's the fair market value then of those particular investments. So, hey, Marcia, yes. really quick. There is a question in the chat. It says, is it important to do a property assessment when there is a surviving spouse? Yes, because here's the deal. You may have your property in joint tenancy with right of survivorship. If one person dies, then our step up in basis is only for that half of the person that died. So if it's a joint tenancy, if it's going to the spouse, we want that just in case that later on we end up selling. If we don't sell, not as big a problem. Okay, if we don't sell it, there's no capital gain. So right now what we've got is a generational opportunity that we get a step up in basis every time somebody passes away. And then when you hear the newspapers talking about proposals that are made in Congress, and if they happen to mention step up in basis, that's what they're talking about. Okay. Now, I also did a calculation to find out what would be the difference if grandpa decided to gift the farm or ranch to Greg. And the way that grandpa would do this, and it has been done, is, oh, he's concerned about the federal estate tax. So, without talking to his accountant, without talking to his attorney, he does a quick claim deed and puts it in the name of the grandson. So he's made a gift, okay? And then the grandson sells the property. <laughs> the capital gain that that grandson is going to have is $1,600,550. Okay, so what we call that is the carryover basis because what happened is the 50,000 is the basis of grandpa. So 
we'll get into that more at one of our future fabulous Fridays. But from a tax savings viewpoint, the grandson is really better off tax-wise. If he's going to sell it, if grandpa leaves it to him at death rather than gifting it. Now, those are tax reasons. There may be very important reasons why grandpa decides he's just going to make a gift to the grandson. And, you know, the grandson isn't going to sell the property. So, hey, that's okay because the grandson is involved in decision making. He's going to take over the place. So there are personal reasons as well as tax reasons for some of the things that we decide to do with something like that. Well, Kim, I can see that we're rolling right along here today, and uh, we want to go ahead and uh, see if there's any questions before we bring on Brianna. So, are there questions in the chat room, Carrie? Well, I'll say the observation from this uh, lady slipper is it is about time to wrap it up so we can get to our guest. And I hope we did steer, we steered you to an awareness of the time sensitive task that must be completed after a person dies. We hope we steered you to the legal tasks that need to be done. And, you know, if your memory's like mine, uh, not like the elephant's head, you know, uh, these resources that we've got provide you with the opportunity to refresh your memory and then also learn new things because we've got over 50 different monk guides out there. And also don't forget that these estate planning materials are available from your MSU Extension office. And that could be at your reservation office or that one that's located in the county. Now, what we're going to be looking at next week are using estate planning tools that the legislature has provided for us to avoid probate on many of our assets. We'll talk to you about the new one for vehicles and vessels. And basically what this, these tools allow us to do is save more money to be able to leave those to our heirs. So Kim and I will be getting that ready for you next week. Now let's take a look at our um, trivia. I ask you the definition of a devisy, and that's really a person in a will to receive property from the deceased person. Okay, and that deceased person is called a testator. Okay, and a devise, that would be another one I could ask for another time, but a devise is, the, is what you're leaving them. So this is part of that legal language that is used in a will. And I think it's important for you to know those terms so that when you see it in a will, you don't look at it and go, ah, oh, geez, how do you understand what this person is talking about? Well, that's the legalese part of it. Devise, devise, uh, and an heir is somebody that receives property because a person died without writing a will. Yeah, only the attorneys worry about those kinds of things. And then we've got, what's the meaning of the word ancillary? Well, that's if a deceased Montanan had property located in another state. So you land barons out there that may own property in Wyoming and North Dakota, and you die, there's still gonna have to be an ancillary probate to distribute the property in that other state. And see, if you die without a will, that state law determines where that property goes. And it may not be the same as Montana. If you have a will, that state will honor the will. So that's another reason. If you're a land baron type person, go ahead and have that will so that you can control where that property goes in another state. And then the question we had, how long do creditors have if we print the notice in the paper? And take a look at those sometimes. Even our small community papers have some of those legal notices. And I was looking at those that are in the Bozeman Chronicle just to refresh my memory about those. And you've got four months to turn over uh, the bills that are there. 
So I'm looking and hoping that we have Brianna on. Uh, Carrie, is she here yet? She is. Oh, great. Okay, that means I can close my screen. I'll stop sharing so that you can all meet her. Hey there, welcome. Hi, and guys. Yeah, well, I want to introduce uh, you to our participants today. Um, hey, out there, we are very thrilled to have Brianna, who is an ambassador with the 4-H program. And I thought I'd just uh, start by having her. Boy, do I see some awards around there? Are those yours? No, I'm actually in my FFA advisor's office right now. Okay. I thought maybe they were. Well, tell us about your 4-H story, Brianna. Yeah, so I joined 4-H when my older sister did, when I was about four years old through the Cloverbud program, which is really awesome. Um, I've attended about 16, 15 to 16 county fairs, and it's been a huge part of my life and has contributed in a large sum to who I am today. Um, I joined not really knowing what my interests were, but that I wanted to do horse. I wanted to be a part of the horse project. And I begged and begged and begged my parents to buy me a horse for this project. And finally they caved. And so I started out with that. I got really involved in the sheep project as well. And then when I was about in the seventh grade, I got really involved in the teen leadership program, which is my absolute favorite aspect of 4-H. Um, I wasn't too involved to begin with. I went to state Congress and I kind of dabbled in the, the local county level. Then I soon became a county ambassador, which was super fun. I did that for a few years. And then my sophomore year, I went to my second, no, my um, freshman year, I went to my second state conference, com, Congress, excuse me, went to my second state Congress and served on the nominations committee for the state ambassadors, which I met a ton of very inspiring people. I then decided that I wanted to run for state office and obtained that in my junior year. So now I'm a senior here at Joliet High School in Carbon County and just really enjoying being able to serve the organization that has contributed to my life so much. Well, that is great. And you mentioned 4 H Congress. Uh, I don't think a lot of people here would know what that is. Why don't you describe 4 H Congress to us? So, state conference, Congress, excuse me, is a uh, um, it's like a state convention of what you would see in FFA or BPA or FCCLA. Um, it's just, we come together, there's a few competitive events, which are really fun. You can earn trips to the National Congress, which is in Atlanta, Georgia, and also earn trips to the Denver, excuse me, the Denver Stock Show which uh, um, a few members that I know have been able to do, and they say that it's one of the best experiences ever. We do a few workshops, we dance, we have some fun. Um, it's really just a great opportunity for members throughout the state to be able to get together, form those connections, network, and uh, learn some leadership skills and compete in those events. Yeah, well, that's neat. Um, tell us more about what you do as an ambassador. So through my state ambassador position, I am able to serve on the Montana Extension Advisory Council as the youth voice, which is really important to me. I pride myself on being able to advocate, advocate for not only agriculture as a whole, but also youth and youth development and youth leadership. And honestly, everything that Extension stands for. I actually just got back from those meetings uh, two weeks ago, I think, and I learned a ton, which is very beneficial to me and I value extremely. Through my other state officer position, I actually have the responsibilities of two. I um, handle all the social media and regulate um, public appearances through my, that my team does. So things like I'm doing right now, coming on Fabulous Fridays and uh, um, news interviews, I guess, and radio broadcasts. On top of, I also serve as the secretary through that position for my officer team, which is really awesome. At the local county, at the local ambassador level, um, it really depends on what your county does and how your county utilizes that ambassador program, which you see it differ a lot throughout the rest of the state. In my county, we help out a lot at FAIR, 
we do a few service projects and it, honestly anything really that we can get our hands on to get people involved like recruitment activities we put on a clover bud camp which is super fun and do some school visits or we did pr prior to covid yeah when you mentioned uh clover buds uh how young can somebody join 4-h you were young you said you told me yesterday you really started at four because of your family but uh when did clover buds get started um essentially i honestly don't know like the actual age but it's mostly just if you have like younger siblings who are in your club or you know are at your meetings anyways why not get them involved it's mostly just kind of that gateway towards full-fledged membership which you get to be a part of at eight and become a novice and then you move up in the ranks from there and be able to kind of unlock levels, I guess, and be able to experience some new opportunities and experiences through just the program as a whole. Yeah, I understand that you're also a member of uh, FFA. Uh, so if you were gonna compare FFA and 4-H, uh, why do you, do you like one better than the other and why? Um. Well, I definitely think that this is an issue, especially that gets kind of confused through people who don't have never really been involved in FFA or 4-H. Um, they kind of get lumped together, which is really odd to me because they're very different in a lot of ways. Um, in FFA, you experience a lot more of those competitive events, although it still has the leadership opportunities. It's also based more on agriculture than, I guess, not exactly more, but it doesn't really make way for those communication skills and family consumer science skills that you would see through the 4-H program. Um, I also really wouldn't say that I have a favorite just because they're different in a lot of ways. Um, I've been involved in FFA since I was in the eighth grade because that's when we're able to join in my school. And it's, it's definitely impacted me a lot, but 4-H has obviously been in my life a lot longer and I've had a lot of opportunities through both and I definitely think that when you're talking to members who are in both organizations just keep in mind that they are very different and there's a lot of different things that go into each and it's going to impact everyone in different ways I honestly don't think that you would find a 4-H member or an FFA member who could choose whether they liked one or the other more oh okay and uh, yesterday you mentioned about Rec Lab. What t what are you involved with this? Tell us what Rec Lab is. Yeah, so throughout the year, we actually have a few different statewide conferences. Fall leadership training is one that my ambassador team puts on. And then this next upcoming one that we're actually gonna be attending in March is called Rec Lab. It's uh, more of just like a fun type of thing. It's goes by regions on who gets to put it on, which I think is really cool because then you get to see different aspects of each region in our state. Um, this year it's going to be in Hobson. We'll do some leadership workshops. There'll be a keynote speaker. Um, there's also just some really fun workshops that you get to go to. Like my ambassador team is putting on not only a team building leadership one, but also a dance workshop where we can kind of collaborate with kids throughout the state on the differences and camp songs or different line dances that they do, things like that, just in order to give our ambassadors the tools that they need in order to plan good and beneficial county events. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a tough two years. How have you connected with people across the state that you're, uh, you know, how, how do you communicate? Yeah, so actually the state ambassador team and even at the local level, you can see a lot of different ways that these ambassadors have uh, kind of taken the steps towards and really use their critical thinking skills in order to solve the communication gap that we would be seeing because of COVID. Um, all of our state conferences got canceled in 2020 due to that, or I guess not 2020, but you know, the, the years of the COVID, um, yeah. except for last year, we were able to do all of our conferences at like state Congress, and then we were able to do fall leadership last year as well. Um, through the state ambassador team, they implemented the leadership academies that we do every month in the spring on a Sunday. We're actually holding one this Sunday that I get to teach. 
um, which I think is a really cool opportunity for kids who maybe even can't attend those statewide conferences on a regular year. Um, I also think that everyone's kind of amped up their presence on social media. I know that that's what my county ambassador team did in order to kind of bridge that gap and make sure that everyone was still being able to experience 4-H things. And it's also given leeway to be able to continue to do that even after we're able to meet in person and be able to form those connections. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think that using technology to our advantage was a big way that we were able to connect with those people statewide and network and be able to continue working towards that youth development that we strive to achieve. Mm, that's quite something, you know, you guys are dedicated enough that you're going to meet on a Sunday afternoon, which is probably the only time that all of you have uh, to come together. And you said, you're going to be teaching this Sunday. Uh, what give us a little background about what you'll teach. So this, uh, this spring, we were able to pick topics on each month of what we wanted. Um, each of our ambassadors to kind of put on a mini zoom workshop for. Um, mine is about ages and stages and the way that 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 knowing that information can contribute to be to you being a better leader. So, this can be used when planning county camps or when you're thinking of activities to do for fair. Um, it's honestly, the leadership academy just really puts a lot of those tools in our ambassadors belts in order to um, really amplify the. The benefits that you're going to be seeing in those leadership positions and in those events. Oh, that, that's great. Boy, a lot going on uh, with with you and the ambassadors. How many ambassadors are there in the state? Uh, this year, there's four. Normally, we have five. Um, due to COVID, we saw a lot of numbers drop, not only in enrollment as a whole in Montana 4-H, but also especially in the leadership, the team leadership program, which I find is pretty sad due to you know, we had a lot of seniors graduate, yes, but I also uh -huh. think that it's important to make sure that we're still advocating and educating and also pushing out that information to the members and the offices about the opportunities available through the team leadership program. Yeah, I guess I was, I thought there were a, a gob of, yeah, I guess I'd seen at Congress and uh, uh, I was honored last year, or not last year, pre-COVID, to be able to see what went on with the ambassadors and, and the great way they did that banquet in the evening and the awards recognition and everything. It was just very clever as well as educational. Uh, can you share with us some of your future plans after you graduate? Yeah, so I actually plan to attend MSU Bozeman in order to pursue a degree in agriculture education and a minor in ag business. I plan to either be an ag teacher in the school system or become an extension agent later in life. Okay, well, I tell you what, we'll be looking forward to that, won't we, Kim? Well, yeah, I graduated with Ag Ed too, so good job. <laughs> Do any of our participants have some questions that they would like to ask Brianna? There was a comment in the chat that said, um, awesome leadership to our young, in our young adults. So that was awesome. Yeah. Sorry, I talked over someone. Go ahead. No, it was just me, Kim. No worries. Okay, well, I, I think, uh, all of the folks will join me in thanking you, Brianna, and also thank your teacher for letting you out of class. Uh, maybe this will count towards something that they say was very good. You did an excellent job, and we're just, uh, you know, when we see these kind of situations, we go, there's hope for the future because of our good 4-H folk. So thanks a lot, and uh, we'll be in touch with you, and I'll enjoy seeing you coming to MSU, and. I'll be back in Linfield and maybe we can have a cup of coffee sometime. That'd be fun. I look forward to it. Thank you guys so much for having me. You bet. It. Well, we also want to thank everybody out there that joined us today. And uh, next week, we're going to have some another great guest. Looking forward to that. Uh, Carrie or Kim, any last minute questions that people have? Yeah, there was one that says, um, 
hopefully they're still on, but it says, my mom and dad owned property together. My mom died 10 years ago. We did not get a new appraisal at that time. Dad sold his property this year. Would his basis be the original purchase price or would it be the EST? I, I think that means the state value of the property when mom died. Okay, um, we'll go back in history and look at that. At at the time, did they own the property in joint tenancy when mom died? And if so, there was a step up in basis, but the step up was only for half of it, okay? So some way we're going to have to go back and figure out what the fair market value was and see that's an extra cost that's going to be now uh, compared to what we would have had to do at that point in time. And so I would suggest that this is a good time to get your accountant involved and also an attorney just to make sure that you're doing it the right way and not have something down the road that's going to cost you additional dollars, particularly if the place is going to be sold. So if you have further questions about that, don't hesitate to send me an email and I'll sit down with it and help you take a closer look. Okay, well, if I'm not hearing further questions, I'm going to say great that you joined us again. We enjoyed presenting for you. Stay tuned for next week. And in the meantime, uh, I keep saying be safe and keep healthy so that we can join together. So have a great weekend and we'll see you around. Bye-bye.